Thank you for joining us here at the uh, the summit. We're going to move on to our second set of tech sessions for the morning here. Uh, my name is Mark Johnson, and uh, I actually, uh, for those of you in this room before, I obviously was in the in the area uh, in, uh, up here just before this in storage. But we're going to move on from the storage area. We're now looking at material science and materials for energy. And I'm joined on stage again with Dane Boyson, who's my uh, my colleague, as well as Samuel Tabar, who's a uh, an RPE fellow that's looking at uh, chemistry and materials really in some depth as well on this. And both Dean and I are material scientists and materials engineers by training. And so, how many people here are material scientists? Great. That's fantastic. Ah. Yeah. Um, I, like to, I like to think about materials this way. Everything else going on in these sessions, everything else is just a theoretical paper calculation Unless you make it out of something, you're not going to be able to do anything in energy, right? No bias. No bias. No bias at all. Yeah. So materials and breakthroughs in materials are essential platforms for transforming the energy sector. We become the tools by which everyone else can wind up doing things. You know, humanity measures its progress by materials, from Stone Age, Iron Age, Silicon Age. So this is an essential part of what RPE looks at. You break down into it. Developing new materials is a, a key aspect of, uh, of what RBE does. So most material scientists, we're all familiar with the sort of material science tetrahedron. It started out as the triangle, then it went to the tetrahedron, then it's got a tetrahedron with the center in it. Uh, but it's looking at different facets of material science where you've got structure-property relationships that we're all familiar with. School then, right? How does structure determine the property of a material that you can then use in an application? And how's processing inform that structure, create that structure. So these are the, the tools that we wind up use, using. And then there's huge breakthroughs in characterization, being able to actually control and understand materials all the way down to the atomic level, atomic scale chemistry. Huge, huge scientific breakthroughs that come out of materials. So one thing that's a little different about looking at RPE's approach is the system impact. Right? It's not just materials research in isolation of the system. It's saying we can quantify there's a need in a system. And we also are working with the people in those systems to say we have a certain set of properties we need to control or an envelope of how those properties need to be controlled. And in doing that, we make possible everything else that winds up happening with breakthroughs in energy. So there's kind of three areas of materials or broad categories of materials we're going to talk about today that we break it down to in the RPE and looking at how we create those system level breakthroughs through material science innovations. One's looking at critical materials. We've actually run one solicitation directly on critical materials issues, but that was just one slice at it. We're looking at a much broader area and how, do, how, do, how, do, how are materials critical that only a certain set of materials might have the properties that provide that system level impact and how we get beyond that first criticality. Enabling materials, I think it's the way people often think about material science. It's saying, we've got a certain set of properties. If we can push the set of properties further, these materials have creep resistance at higher temperature, for instance, better electron mobility. As a result of that property, we'll be able to get greater system level functionality. Then we've got intelligent materials as well. The big breakthrough that's happened, not only in, in, in computation, is the breakthrough in electronics and things like power electronics. So now we can actually independently sense and actuate and then control a material. So having that knob where if you can wind up actually actively controlling a material, controlling those properties in a system, huge breakthrough opportunity. So talking first about the critical materials issue. So what makes a material critical? Actually, the National Academy of Sciences did a, some work on this about five, six years ago, come up with a definition saying there's two vectors of criticality. One is where there's a risk of supply disruption. Now, you can think about things like rare earths, and you might put that in sort of a geopolitical context, but it could also be things like a limited number of manufacturing facilities. Right? If you only have one capability of producing this as a certain area, now you only have one supply chain for that material. You also have looking at things like the importance to your application. And DOE did a study, this is the, uh, the graph in the upper center, um, in December 2010. Anyone that's looking at this field, I'd suggest you actually download that study from the DOE website. It's called the Critical Materials Study. 
2010, and then it was updated just uh, about three months ago, 2011, in the Policy and International Affairs Office. And they went element by element through materials and said, where is the impact on the application? That is, how many alternatives do we have to providing a system level functionality than the one that's being used? And then where's the supply risk? Right? What it came out at was, as, uh, as uh, many people have looked at the rare earths being an issue, things like over a five to 15 year time horizon, neodymium and dysprosium, particularly for magnets, for high temperature magnets, are very critical materials. But you also have things like europium, yttrium, terbium. These are used for, for instance, the uh, uh, fluorescent materials in fluorescent tubes, and even in uh, things like uh, LEDs. Then you're looking at other materials like uh, cobalt, gallium, and indium. Things are used for indium tin oxide, transparent conducting oxides. At RPE, we looked a little bit broader. We said it's not just looking at the importance of clean energy, it's across the energy infrastructure. So you say end uses in vehicles, you think about electric vehicles, motors, even the batteries, the metals and nickel metal hydride. Wind turbines, having direct drive wind turbines, tremendous amount of, of magnetic materials needed. Lighting, having the availability of phosphors for as we wind up getting higher and higher efficiency, how that moves us from a criticality, one kind of criticality to another criticality. Photovoltaics, you've got the transparent oxides on the surface of that, have some very critical materials, huge opportunities for technology development in that area. Fuel cells, you're looking at yttria stabilized zirconia, for instance, yttria, critical material. <coughs> then you're looking at things like fuel refining, you know, fluid catalytic cracking and the zeolites that are used in that, they're rare stabilized zeolites. And even things like gas turbines, what are the coatings that are put on a natural gas turbine or on a, on a, on a turbine that goes into a, a jet aircraft that allows higher temperature operation? Well, those are all you know, plasma sprayed coatings on the surface that are actually have some critical materials in it. So there's a range of materials that are out there. Now, if you look at what ARPA-E is focused on in, in the REACT program, it was looking at those end use technologies to begin with. At the bottom, you've got a typical supply chain from the beginning, extraction of a resource, processing, developing components, developing end, end use applications. We focused on saying how we can develop some application alternatives around magnetics, but that's not to say that's the only way you could have some innovation. There's huge opportunities for innovation, for instance, in the extraction and processing area. Right? How, how you can wind up developing um, you know, extractive metallurgy processes that have smaller footprints. We wind up making it so it's not only getting that resource cheaper, but actually has less of an impact on the environment in the process. Huge areas for R&D in that. So in the REACT program, just to give you an idea of some of the materials innovations we're looking at, we're, what we did is we wound up setting system level targets. We said, wind up getting a, a hundred, greater than 100 kilowatt motor at a, at a uh, $1.9 per kilowatt le or less, and, and looking at, uh, excuse me, uh, 1.9 uh, kilowatts per kilogram or, or, uh, or more as far as the energy density and less than $3 per kilowatt. So this shows beyond the existing learning curve, but then doing that for an order of magnitude reduction in the rare earth content. A couple areas people can think about is how do you make rare earth free magnets? Because if you look at the, the, the actual the remnants and the magnetic remnants, that all comes out of the transition metals. So it's things like iron and neodymium iron, boron. And what, what the rare earth does is it provides the coercivity. So are there other mechanisms, physical mechanisms we can use for getting that anisotropy to get that coercivity? So you look at some, uh, some examples here. We've got things like um, iron nickel, the L10 phases. Okay. Now, these are phases that we know are magnetic. They show up in meteorites. That's an ordered phase. It's thermodynamically stable below 370 <coughs> degrees Celsius. The problem is it's kinetically hindered. Diffusion doesn't work at those low temperatures very well. So if you were to take a melt of iron nickel at the right composition and cool it down at something like a tenth of degree Kelvin per millennium, you would have a great magnet. That's not really a state, you know, scalable industrial process. So do we have new processes where we can wind up actually forming those thermodynamically stable phases by direct synthesis at low temperature? Okay, so just one example. There's other examples out there, but we're interested in this kind of technology. The other areas you say, you know, 
in magnets, the system level functionality that's needed is just the ability to couple electricity to torque. And it's not the magnet itself, it's what it does. So things like advanced superconductors, huge opportunity to create that magnetic field for coupling. How we can wind up pushing second generation high temperature superconducting wire further and further. So you wind up having about a 4x increase in the cur current density of those tapes. That goes straight to the capability of creating high, de high, high energy dense uh, magnetic fields. Looking at areas of enabling materials, here are a couple of areas that RPE is doing some work in so far. And again, these are just the last illustrating some areas we've done some, some, uh, some projects in. And there's many more out there. So one area is looking at fuel cells. So talking to people about does RPE invest in fuel cells? You look at some of the fundamental problems fuel cells have, one of the technical challenges they have that we could overcome. You look at proton exchange membrane cells, how you wind up increasing transport properties by minimizing the crossover form. Also, one of the things, how do we move away from precious metal catalysts? So if we went from a PEM exchange membranes, proton exchange membranes, to alkaline exchange membranes, now your catalysts can switch from things like platinum to things like iron and nickel. Well, that suddenly changes the cost structure dramatically. The challenge is, how do we wind up synthesizing those uh, hydrogen hydroxide exchange membranes, those alkaline exchange membranes. So there's a lot of materials polymer chemistry that needs to be worked out on that. It's new insight in that. We've got a couple of projects that are working in that area. But I think there's really a, an area that can be mined further because this can actually transform the direction the fuel cell industry is working in. And oh, by the way, if you change the electrolytes on either side of that from being hydrogen and oxygen to more energy dense materials, you can actually wind up getting a flow back. So it's got a lot of areas that this can wind up enabling. In energy production, and I should say that those breakthroughs are, are enabled by structure property relationship. Then you look at energy production, you look at photovoltaics. This is actually, I believe, RPE's only uh, project in photovoltaics because there's a lot of things that can be done in photovoltaics. Really important things to drive down known learning curves, right, and getting down them very quickly. It's what the entire dollar a watt initiative at DOE is about. The question is, and actually the material side of it, where's the new, new idea? We're looking at one that's a processing enabled. Huge cost driver in silicon photovoltaics is actually the curve losses. Basically, you end up solidifying a, a long piece of, a large piece of, of silicon and then slice it up. Tremendous loss in doing that. Can we have a direct formation of the wafers? Company 1366 is working in that area. Again, a process enabled breakthrough in materials that has system level impact impacting the cost. Third area we look at is intelligent materials. Here's a couple of examples you're looking at. One is electrochromic coatings, company ITN. And they're looking at having high uh, contrast efficiencies uh, in, in applying an external bias across a flexible polymer that can then be applied on a windows for uh, you know, building, uh, applying it to, to buildings and getting greater energy efficiency. Now the key thing to look at in that around intelligent materials is not just do I have a high contrast, but do I have a low leakage current? Right? So often in a material science project, in isolation, people would say, hey, I've got this property. It works, right? I'm able to change from light to dark. They don't put it into a system context. That's what RPE wants to hear. Where's the system context? Not only do we need to have that high contrast ratio, we also need to have low leakage current. And then looking at the, at the, at the uh, liquid focusing, or CSP, this is controlling surface properties. So you can wind up changing the focusing of a lens on a surface. So you have a liquid, liquid on, on the surface. So you wind up, by changing that, uh, those, the um, surface energy, or controlling that surface energy, you're able to then change the lensing shape. So this is an area where the materials interacting with power controls enable a system level functionality. So just to remind people again, what makes it into an RPE product? And we're going to wind up coming over and over on the technical sections and kind of bring, bring in context for specific areas. First question is, what's the impact? So looking at a material breakthrough, it's not just that you're able to understand structure property relationships. That's the starting point. It's really important as a starting point. What you want to be able to do is then say, by controlling that, and getting what I like to call control authority over that structure property relationship, right? 
not just that I processed it and I got a structure and I had some properties, but by the way, if I change the temperatures these ways or I change the conditions, I can get a different outcome of that material that's impactful and meaningful. Putting it in that system context, right? Connecting the material scientists to all the people that are doing all the other sort of theoretical studies around us, right? How they can wind up bringing that back together and bridging those groups. That's important. Has to be transformative, right? Has to be based in science. It's a new thinking around the material science as well, right? So it can't just be we're going to have impact because if we can invent this material, it would really matter, right? We're not looking at alchemy here. We're looking at science, right? How do you wind up actually developing things and having solid science-based material science that can wind up impacting a wide range of energy and technologies? <coughs> Building a bridge. Materials R&D in any sort of new technology space is really hard in that it usually takes about 10 to 15 years at least to move a new materials invention all the way across having impact and deploy. How can we short circuit that? Right? It happens. There are technologies where by building a bridge early on, you're actually innovating in a direction that's going to be the fastest approach to market. And wind up saying, look, this is a big problem. Here's the new science. And we're taking the most direct pathway to actually solving that. And bringing together teams. These are hard problems that require a lot of interdisciplinary thinking and working across those barriers. Uh, first of all is having a community like this all getting together and sort of talking about these issues. And, uh, and, but looking at sort of how do we bring people that may not have been working in the energy sector and start applying those skills in the energy. So with that, I'm going to turn the stage over. We're going to wind up having uh, questions and answers here for a while. We've got a, uh, uh, we've got a uh, microphone out in the middle. I say there's actually a Twitter feed, so I have, if you wind up asking a Twitter, Twitter question, that will be uh, relayed up from the front here, and we can uh, start off with some questions. So I see we've got someone, com someone coming up to the microphone now. Great talk and great discussion. I am Orlando Aucello, a Nargon National Laboratory Fellow. Uh, my question is the following. I see that you are focusing on silicon for photovoltaics. And the problem with silicon, as we know, is the intrinsic limitation of the fast separation of the electron hole pairs that leads to the problem of efficiency. Now, in our laboratory and other laboratories around the world, people are trying to look at new materials like ferroelectrics, in which we can create extremely high electric fields that can separate the electron hole pairs much more efficiently. Would ARPA-E consider research on new materials that can in increase the efficiency of photovoltaic beyond silicon? Thanks, Orlando. I really appreciate the question. Actually, uh, I think you overstated it when you said ARPA-E is focusing on silicon. Um, if you look at uh, all of the ranges, three years ago you said you're setting up a new agency on energy. It would be a natural thing to say, look at solar, right? Of the 180 or so projects that are doing, doing anything in RPE, we have exactly one that's doing anything in photovoltaics at this point. That's the only project. And it's not to say that we're focusing on silicon. saying that's the one that we found. There were a lot of photovoltaic ideas that we've seen. That's the one we found where we said, hey, this is a transformative, different way of thinking about the problem, right? So that's what we're looking for. So what you described is saying, hey, we've got a new thinking about how a material and how there's been a lot of new discoveries in looking at, like, like you said, ferroelectric materials, multi ferroic materials, you know, looking at complex nanostructures, whether it's a, a composite material that you're looking at or, or a homogeneous material that's doing that. There's a lot of basic science that's came out of the Na National Nanoscience Initiative over the last four or five years. That's fertile ground for how we wind up translating those ideas into the area of materials and actually not only putting it into the area of materials, but then putting it in a context where you say, if we're successful in this, here's how it's going to wind up driving down a cost curve. Here's how we're going to get greater efficiency. So it can't just be, hey, we're, we're interested in capturing photons and turning them to electrons, no, sure. but doing it better than the known paradigm. And and the other thing to say is, as I said, it's a long pathway for it. We're not expecting after three years that you're going to beat the current technology. You saw a learning curve drawing that uh, Arun had earlier. By the end of an RPE project, we just want to see is the vector pointing in the right direction that is moving you down a pathway that will ultimately get you to that point where you're beating the, the known learning curve. Thank you. Thank you.
So while we're waiting to get things going here, I'm just going to go to my panelists real quick. Why don't we go to Dean? What's the sort of materials breakthrough that you think is uh, uh, most exciting where you'd like to see some fertile ground out there for, for new ideas? Um, I, I suppose that it doesn't seem like a materials energy problem, but I think actually um, metals refining is probably one of the... Um, we have materials with unique properties. The problem is we can often can't get them out of the ground in a clean and efficient way. I think that uh, this is... Well, let me give you a story as an example. Uh, I'm from Alaska, and we have the second largest copper mine in the world in Alaska. And that will probably never be opened because there hasn't been a copper mine in history that hasn't destroyed every river and stream around it. Now, you could do it with electrons, so this is where the couple between energy and materials is a natural fit. So I think this is an important problem in coupling energy and making materials, but extracting them is as, uh, as important as finding the really unique material properties. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, I think materials that lend themselves to manufacturing in new ways um, from a country standpoint will give us a, a competitive advantage. Materials with unique properties for uh, continuous manufacturing, um, bulk metallic glasses, these kinds of materials I think could be transformative for us as a country and, and in, in the energy space. Cool. Uh, I think one thing that I think is uh, very interesting is self-assembly of materials. And I think something I'd love to see is larger scale uh, demonstrations of function or utility. I think it's uh, tremendously powerful to be able to customize, you know, different nanoparticulate systems, be able to put them in and actually get some kind of functional electronic, for example, like thermoelectrics, where you can actually self-assemble thermoelectrics uh, and reduce the cost of necessarily you know, creating uh, bulk thermoelectrics from rather expensive or semi-rare earth materials to suddenly being able to make these self-assembled systems with cheaper components that can then, you know, address this, you know, big improvement in, you know, thermoelectrics that's needed. So I think things that you can, you know, reduce the cost and have, you know, a thermoelectric that's then replaced by something that's lower cost and a little bit more intelligent in its design and customizable that, that can then give you, a, you know, an improved uh, figure of merit for thermoelectrics, something like that would be tremendously useful. And I think a lot of the demonstrations are usually on a small scale. So if you can demonstrate this on something larger than your hand, I think that'd be fantastic. So Love to hear your ideas. Okay, I mean, fine. that's what we're here for, right? At the end of the day, this is the energy community. Yep. Please. So do you fund scale up? I mean, you talked about, you know, we can do things on this scale. Do you fund go on to the next scale? So that's actually a really good question. We fund research and development that makes moving to the next scale important or, or possible. So if you take the whole area of, let's say, nanotechnology, a lot of money gone into nanoscience, nanotechnology on this. So it's an important area that we wind up having fertile ground around. The question is, what's the science challenge that if you solve it, you're going to wind up going from making you know, milligrams of material to tons of materials? Now. We may not support taking it all the way, let's say, to a pilot manufacturing plant. What we do do is we work very closely with groups that are supporting that. So if you look at almost every RPE project that's a or program, we wind up holding annual meetings within that program. We bring together people from not only DOE, but other parts of the government, let's say Department of, uh, of Defense, Department of Agriculture, that would then it's, they, they're in their lane as far as being able to scale technologies. But we're, we really look at that valley of death issue that's between those two points, right? So it's how do you get it from first demonstration of the science to that point where someone could possibly scale it at that point. We take it very seriously looking at that. Um, there are a lot of really important technical challenges to be solved, often they're materials related challenges, in getting to that point where you have a scalable demonstration of a technology. Right? So the scientific principles prove in one way, but how do we develop a process that makes it scalable? So, you know, to some extent, I, I hope I'm answering your, your question that way. So. The REACT program seems to be assuming that the transducer technology is magnetic in some form or the other. 
Um, I'm from SRI International, Harsha Pralad, and we've developed alternative transducer technologies, and others have as well, that are polymers-based or piezoelectric-based or things like that. Is, is that an area of focus or interest? A absolutely. So what we did is uh, what we wound up supporting were, uh, at the end of the day, were, were materials and system-level innovations around, as you said, a lot of electromagnetic sort of approaches. We did do a few new motor topologies. Oddly, or not oddly, but it's interesting, Tesla did a really good job of 125 years ago. It's hard to beat the efficiency of, of, of the work they wound up doing. But bringing some new breakthroughs, this theory of intelligent materials, and saying how you can couple, you know, if you're looking at things like piezoelectric transducers, now you look at it at a system level, how you can couple breakthroughs in efficient power electronics, for instance, in driving those transducers. And then you wind up coming back down, or those actuators. And then you can wind up breaking that back down and saying, okay, what are the properties we need to hit on those new materials, so a sort of cost property trade off, to make this so it's competitive with electromagnetic coupling of, of energy? So, absolutely, those are some of the things we, we remain interested in. I think a, a fascinating area is there's a lot of breakthroughs in materials that have come out of the communication sector over the last four or five years. So uh, look at things like phase shifters and, and looking at, uh, you know, intelligent multi conductors that are, can do, that are the heart of many telecommunication systems. What are the challenges in using those in an energy environment? So it's not just information you're tra traveling through, but instead of having a, an inductor <coughs> in my cell phone, I have a, an inductor that I can wind up putting into a flexible AC transmission system, right? Okay, that's a really hard challenge because now you're going from thin films to bulk, right? So... But the principle is there. If we could wind up developing that material, it would have impact in the energy area. Um, so I'm just going to go on just for one more second. I think an area that the materials community could really benefit from is going out and finding the local power systems design engineers. These are two communities that really haven't talked together a lot. We're finding when we, when we get people working together at that intersection, they come together and say something like, um, Boy, if I only had a battery that had these cost characteristics, we'd wind up having impact. If I only had a tunable inductor that had such and such characteristics, I can change how I design a substation. That's really powerful. That's bringing together teams that would not work together. It breaks it down to them saying, okay, now I need to invent that new material and figure out how to do that. But bringing those communities together is really powerful. Hello, uh, I'm Dan Kinzer from Fairchild uh, Semiconductor. We we yep. uh, we have some very advanced silicon carbide device technology, and what we really need are uh, dislocation-free, low-cost, large-diameter silicon carbide wafers. And I know the government has been uh, supporting this kind of research, but I was just wondering what what are you doing now about uh, silicon carbide, and is uh, ARPA E involved in that at all? And, yeah, and so other we've got one program going right now, the ADAPT program, that is looking at specifically uh, agile delivery of power technology, power trans transistors, excuse me, um, and uh, looking at silicon carbide and gallium nitride technologies on that. For instance, getting epitaxial buffer layers that allow much higher voltage standoff, mm -hmm. going from, I think the state of the art was around 12,000 volts prior to the RPE program. You need to get up to about 20,000 volts to be able to use these in a distribution transformer system. To square root of 2 times the 13.6 kb line that you have there. You need a 20 kb breakdown in your buffer layer. That's a hard dislocation free material to be able to accomplish. Then looking at new crystal growth technologies. So um, we haven't funded anything in bulk silicon carbide growth that I know of yet. We are funding things, supporting things in bulk gallium nitride growth mm -hmm. at this point. So you look at a company like Sora and Momentum Materials. So we've been working with both of those companies at this point, saying, where are the new crystal growth technologies that are necessary? It's a really hard problem. There's, what, 250 polytypes of silicon carbide out there. Um, how you wind up growing that as a crystal-free, defect-free material is a challenge, and, and we're absolutely interested in new ideas and new thinking in that area. Well, the industry has made a lot of advances, and so I guess you could say this is one of the more maturing uh, yeah. technology areas, but the... There's still uh, too many dislocations. There's still too small, yeah. too small diameter. So yeah, micro, micro pipe free material. That's, that's micro pipe generous. free is almost there. We need the basal plane dislocations uh, eliminated as well. Great, thank you. 
Hi, my name is Michael Gorel. I'm with NanoComp Technologies in New Hampshire. We uh, are a producer of macro-level sheets, wires, and tapes made purely of carbon nanotubes. Uh, for a long time, as you know, carbon nanotubes have not been able to achieve any kind of scale industrial, industrially, and we've, we appear to be the first and at present only player in that space. And it looks like it will lightweight planes and automobiles in terms of external structures, replace wires to reduce weight, uh, copper wires to reduce weight in automotive and, uh, air, importantly, aerospace, which saves, you know, a pound of weight on a rocket ship will save uh, uh, 20,000, I think it's 20,000 bucks for every pound you have to launch into space. It's $4,000 of uh, Afgas fuel for every pound you save on an airplane. Um, is this an area that I, don't, I haven't seen carbon nanotubes or, or this kind of material in your critical materials focused historically? Is this an area you might look at? Is it, it seem, we seem to fit. It's, it's an advanced material. It saves energy. So to answer your, your uh, question specifically as far as the critical materials issue, so I think it's a material science opportunity. Certainly it's a material science opportunity out there. What we focused on the critical materials issue was looking specifically at those neodymium and dysprosium high criticality. So looking at magnetic properties, which is where they are broadly used in, was the focus of that one solicitation. That's not to say it's trying to solve every problem in material science with that one solicitation. So I think a better way to look at it is say, okay, where does that wind up solving a problem around things like say, you know, capacitors. I know we've been funding some work in nanowire capacitors, things like that at this point. So we have done some work in that area. Um, you put it in the right kind of context, though, of saying, here's the problem in energy. You know, there is an embedded energy and a consumption of energy cost related to the strength to weight ratio of the materials. Right? So how do you wind up then translating that to saying, if we only made the jump to the next performance envelope, we would then have some quantitative, potential quantitative impact on the energy sector. And here's the science that we can bring to this to say, how do we move from where we are now to the next level beyond that? So, so is that to say you would, you would encourage me to go to more uh, application-specific topics within DOE or that you're actually open to something where... So uh, everything at RPE, you need to wind up tying it to what is the end-use application that's going to have impact, right? So. Whether it's, whether it's one of these opportunities where you were open to any idea in energy or you're looking at a specific problem to be solved, those are kind of two modalities of how we wound up supporting things in the past. In both cases, you want to tie it to here's where the impact's going to be from this innovation, right, as far as the materials <laughs> innovation that comes out of it. The other key part is then saying what's the new technology we need to invent, right? So this is where RPE's lane is. is we're downstream of the fundamental science, so we're not a place to go to to say, hey, we need to develop a new scientific infrastructure to study, study some fundamental capability. But we're also not the scaling people, right? We're not at downstream. We're saying that first step of the first prototype out of the lab and the first demonstration of a process to show that if that's successful, it then can potentially be scaled. And then working with people to say, here's how we can scale up beyond that. Thanks. The way I like to look at it is we fund solutions, not technologies. Hi, my name is Dave Matheson. I'm a professor at Case Western Reserve University. And um, the National Academy recently released the uh, report on the materials genome yes. about marrying the advances in computation with uh, demands and ideas on materials. And I was wondering if RPE had any uh, uh, intention of participating in that arena. We actually do participate in the materials <laughs> genome arena in right. the sense of, but, it, but it's got to be that part of it that is consistent with what our mission and our lane is. Right? It's got to be related to energy. It also has to be not just fundamental science of, let's say, computation <coughs> of, mater of materials. That, that's things like the Office of Science, and that's the right lane. We don't want to duplicate that in any manner. But what we do is how we marry up from the outcomes from that, to say now we've got some tools to do materials genome. How do we do the translational science? Right? So if you take the analogy to the bio, biological community where they have you know, the genome <coughs> genome, and then they wind up translating it to medicine. Right? So 
we're that next translational component of it. It's exactly, we actually model a lot of our designs and our processes around what, what is done with that genetic community to say how, uh, how we do that translational science component. So that's, that's a good way to actually think about what we're working on. Okay. You know, as an example, in the Beast program, we have uh, Gerd Sater, who kind of started, the, well, coined the materials genome, I guess, name originally. And that company is a magnesium ion battery based on doing materials discovery for cathodes for magnesium ion batteries. And so there is, a, there is interest, but it's got to have an application. So you don't uh, specifically call out the use of that methodology, but if it's applicable, it put it in. Yeah, yeah. It's this, you know, we want the scientific backbone of the country to be utilized, right? Same as the, the all the nanoscience investment that's gone out there. You know, you look at one of the areas that uh, the genomics genomics community has done great work on. It's high throughput screening, right? So how can some of those ideas be brought into material science more and more, right? How it can be from just a, a, a one-off experiment, repeated, 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 to very rapid screening of different compositions, and properties, and processes, to very quickly getting an understanding of where that envelope of structural property behavior is that's going to have an impact. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Alan Ray from the Nanomaterials Innovation Center in Alfred, New York. We're putting together a consortium to look at mining electronic waste to extract rare earths and also to convert them as far as phosphorus or magnetics. Question is, from ARPA-E's perspective, would you be interested in part of that value chain or the whole value chain? So what we look at is saying, where's the technology gap that's within that value chain? Right. Right. So you look at, at take uh, fluorescent tubes is a great example of it. <laughs> So if you look at fluorescent tube recycling, there's about 10% of all the tubes in the country wind up getting recycled back through you know, Home Depot or wherever um, and in, in the industrial sector. Right now, the current state of the art is they take the metal end caps off of that, cover the metal. They take right. the mercury out of it to extract it. They crush everything else up and put it in road beds. Exactly. So where's the technology to economically and where's the price points to wind up extracting the rare earth out of those phosphors and separating that out? Yeah, it's a scientific question that's out there. That's the part that RBE would be, be looking at. So how do you wind up taking that first scientific solution towards that? Yes, the technology step is in the extraction of the rare earths from those streams rather than the normal rare earth ores. Yep. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And you look at sort of non-traditional, when we have extraction up there on that graph, you'll see there was recycling and reuse mm -hmm. as well. So you're looking at non-traditional extraction. It's not just looking at rare earths. There's a number of materials where you look at the supply chain. It's an incredibly robust recycling supply chain around lead. I didn't realize that something like over 90% of all lead is mm -hmm. secondary reuse at this point. It's a really robust supply chain as far as recycling it. How can we get that to almost every other material that we wind up having and make it so it's more cost effective than getting the material by other approaches? Right? So that's, that's the challenge as you look at across the range of materials and looking at that, that supply chain process. Dane, you've talked a little bit about the sort of materials process intensification. This right in line with those sort of those mm. sort of thoughts. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi there, Aaron Newman, Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, I'm just wondering if you could give some examples of uh, how projects are transformational rather than an incremental improvement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so. What you want to be able to do is uh, the transformational part is actually embedded in that and in that uh, in that techno-economic analysis essentially. You're putting it on a new learning curve because obviously the, this goes back you know hundreds of years the statement that we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Scientific research is interlocking in terms of the knowledge. The impact though is different, right? So if you come along and say, boy, people in one field of material science are thinking about this problem in one way and no one's applied it to this new problem, that becomes transformational. You know, if there's essentially a known industry roadmap that says, you know, by 2015 we have to accomplish this goal, this goal, this goal, you can quantitatively hit the metrics at it, it's a pretty good sign that you're on a evolutionary learning curve. 
It's really important technology problems getting down those evolutionary learning curves. They're really hard and the goal is to get down those learning curves faster than everyone else. But what a transformational learning curve does is it brings a new way of thinking about the problem fundamentally. So. I would, couldn't agree more. Um, I guess a good example of, of this is, is in the BEASTS program. Uh, the current progress in batteries is about 5% increase in energy density a year. At that rate, we'll never get to where we want to go if we want to electrify our vehicles. And so we set the goal of 400 watt hours per kilogram. That's double. And some of our portfolio companies are hitting that goal in two years. That's 150% increase per year. That's what we're looking for, looking for transformation. So, so if you look in the grids program, actually, with, we have this $100 a kilowatt hour target that we're out there. If you look at uh, uh, some of the responses that came in, you, you, you had people actually very angry uh, letters essentially coming in saying, I've done the calculation, it is physically impossible to accomplish this target. And they didn't put the words at the end, with my technology, right? <laughs> so um, it forces new learning, right? Having those hard targets forces new learning that's out there. So, thank you. Hi, uh, Jim Greenberger from NatBat, the National Alliance for Advanced Technology Batteries. Yep. Have a question regarding intellectual property rights and projects that are funded by ARPA-E. Who owns them? How are they handled? Uh, what, uh, what, what's the story? The, uh, the performer teams own the intellectual property. Uh, the government does maintain uh, essentially margin rights. Our goal is, is for you to have the intellectual property and for the performers to be able to commercialize it. Now, it's not our job to tell you how to commercialize it. It's our responsibility to make sure you're commercializing it. That's why we maintain that. We don't want to invent, uh, give you the right to patent a new technology and put it on the shelf and never have it see market because that transformational technology would disrupt your current product line. Right? That's not the thing we want to get at. We want you to transform and then move it to the marketplace. But at the same time, a key part of that is having a sound intellectual property strategy around it. Um, so much so that if you look at actually our authorization language, we've got an obligation to spend, I think it's 5% of our funds, on tech transfer and outreach activities. And we, in fact, put that, those resources down in the projects and have milestones related to tech transfer and outreach for each of the projects to say, let's hold you accountable for actually moving that technology forward, building your intellectual property portfolios around that technology. It's a key part of being able to make it possible to get to the, this to market. So short answer is performers. Right. Do you have a Twitter question, I think? To you, Mark. What's the relationship between DOE's Next Generation Materials Program and ARPA-E's Energy Related Materials Programs? So we work really closely, actually, with the Department of Energy's Office of Science. Um, we're out visiting them, and they're in visiting us on a very routine basis. I saw a couple of people, I think John Vetrano was in the back of the room here a little earlier. So if you look at the relationship more broadly, though, between what is the Office of Science work on and where's RPE's link, I think that's a, it's a broader question that we wind up working at, saying the Office of Science is building out that breakthroughs and discovery. Right? How's the first time you can wind up discovering something? Where RPE is really looking at that breakthrough in technology, right? how you can take that discovery and translate that into meaningful, impactful technology. So we try and work very closely relative to each other, not only with the DOE's Office of Science, but we also have similar sort of relationships with National Science Foundation, Office of Naval Research, AFOSR, ARO, you name it. And we want to take and translate scientific breakthroughs into impactful energy areas. You said there was another Twitter question? Just that one, okay. George. I'm George Hajibanais from the University of Delaware. Uh, one of my concerns about the ARPAE uh, program is the duration of the project. And uh, to, to get the idea and, and, and get it working and then at the end apply it to make something real, I think it may be a little short to do it in two or three years. So I just w wanted to 
hear your remarks, your comments about it. So within two or three years, there should be quantitative, verifiable, in, independently assessable progress towards that big picture goal. I think in none of the RBE projects do we expect by the end of three years to have a commercial product that beats the current state of the art. If that was possible, the private sector would already be doing it. We want to point the, the needle in the direction to say, what's that thing that's too early for the private sector to do that's showing the direction you're moving on? Right? So if you're successful at that, what we, want, we also do is we work very, very closely so that as you're show, with, with potential follow-on funders, so that if you're successful in showing that quantitative advance, then we'll wind up having resources. We've got no desire to move someone out to the middle of the valley of death and throw them off the, off the cliff at that point, George. But we also have an obligation to measure people's progress going forward because there's a lot of potential new learning curves. And, you know, how, what's the old saying, how do you have good ideas is try a lot of ideas, right? So, but you have to do that in a systematic manner. Thank you. I, sh I should also say, George, this is an uh, interesting thing about RPE. It's actually in our authorization language. All of us are here for a limited duration. So it's modeled off of DARPA in the sense that after three years, we all have to go ourselves. So what we're constantly doing is bringing new people there, bringing new ideas there, and, and refreshing the ideas, building upon what we already have. And you can see, for instance, the electrofuels program. They're already looking at what's the next stage beyond this, because we know it's going to take a long time to get there. We're quantitatively moving towards those advances. Very chirping. I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, I've grown up in a world of silos and in an ed educational world that doesn't think about systems except for engineers. And yet what we're talking about in energy is incredibly complex systems. And I think one of the dilemmas we have is educating the nation the voters about how complex all this stuff is. It's certainly not a part of our educational system. And the other point I want to raise is that sharing ideas across silos takes time. And we don't allow for that. Our, our, our meeting system is kind of like coming here. We come and hear a presentation and then we leave. And it's like going to the movies because we haven't, you haven't set up a mechanism for us to really get acquainted. And I guess the question, I consider that a real, a real valley of death, that, that you live in your own spaces, and you may talk to one or two people, but again in the Times article yesterday about Bell Labs, they wanted to get all of this cross-discipline conversations going that you ran into people and I don't know how, how, how you're trying to do that, because I certainly don't see it much at the Defense Department. So I think, you know, as a fellow, one thing that we do is come up with new ideas, and we kind of work as a functional internal think tank. And just to get the idea to the point where, it, you know, just to get the initial vetting, uh, we have to have, you know, sometimes we have workshops. And at these workshops, we are expected to, you know, identify people that are in the field, that would you know really know that have the experience and also bring in people that you know they won't have a workshop if it's just those people that doesn't really serve any function what the RPA mission is. Uh, what we do have to do is bring in people that may have expertise in something else and they quite haven't really come to the table and said oh well we can apply this and we can work together. So I think that's something that you know is very integral in the part of getting out an actual program is a FOA and these kind of um, workshops where you have a large you know, spectrum of people coming in uh, with different specialties to come in and maybe you know, hopefully generate an interesting idea or an aspect that we haven't thought about. So you, you hold a meeting uh, once a year, you bring people together, you wind up having 280 individual pro I encourage you actually to go downstairs during the technology exhibition because that's, I couldn't agree with you more. 
that's actually the purpose of this meeting you're at right now, is to break down those silos and wind up moving across those boundaries and wind up negotiating across those boundaries. We've got, as you said, in the Department of Defense, incredibly siloed place. Easiest thing to do is go over and visit AFOSR, ONR, ARO, talk to them and find out where the white spaces are between them, right? And then try and create and identify opportunities. I shouldn't say that's the easiest thing to do, but it's a huge fertile opportunity, right? So we've got actually each of them, right after lunch, giving a talk and having an open, not just even giving a talk, but having an open space to wind up dialoguing and having for all of you to go across those boundaries and talk together. And if you look at, especially, this is the other part, though, of the Valley Depth that I think is really important. I think this gets back to George's question before. If you look at that, I know that op-ed piece yesterday was important in the Times. Big question to ask you. Why did Bell Labs have to close? If they were so good, and this, I know this is counter to, this is my personal opinion, this is probably counter to a lot of scientists that worked at Bell Labs. If they were so good, why could they not translate their own science into commercial success? Which is the flip side of it. They invented the transistor. Why was it not commercialized there? Why was it commercialized elsewhere? They invented the laser diode. It was commercialized elsewhere. So this is a big challenge that we wind up having. How we wind up connecting across these boundaries. So you wind up not only having the scientists working, but you have the entrepreneurs working together with it. You have the business people working together with it. You have investors coming together with it. This is a massive challenge that we're facing. I consider that a design issue. And part of my question is, how do you incentivize the people in government and across all the folks you bring in on these contracts to talk to one another? I mean, it would be so easy to put it into your personnel performance plans. I haven't seen any agency do that. DARPA does. They ask about sharing? Yes. Okay. And the question is, if they're so good at it, why don't they share that with the rest of the Defense Department? That's well outside of our lane. I'll let you do that study. Next question. Hi. My name is Herman Lopez from NVS Systems, one of the ARPA-U recipients. And actually, Dane was referring to one of the companies. We're one of the companies reaching the 400 watt-hour per kilogram energy densities for lithium-ion batteries. So I wanted to follow up on that. It seems like a big push was to achieve the high energy densities. And it seems like companies are already reaching these pretty difficult goals. With respect to lithium-ion batteries, what other aspects is ARPA-U looking into for the next challenges? So in the emerging session, I gave a talk on rapid charging, where, yeah, you can have the range anxiety. You can deal with your energy. And for cost, hopefully get down with addressing the materials. But what about the convenience? If someone's going to go buy a car and they look at a hybrid vehicle, an internal combustion engine, and a pure EV, what's a major driver for people not buying the EV? Well, one of them is rapid charging. So even now, we're trying to address this major issue. And when it's going to rapid charging, it fundamentally changes the way you look at the battery system, because it's not just the battery. Then you have to include thermal management. You have to include communication between your battery pack, your charger, your power electronics, even the grid utility. And so, I mean, there's a lot of active work, I think, right now, looking at, okay, we've gotten there with this. What's next? Just, oh, sorry. Dave, you have a couple of wish lists. Well, yeah, you missed the earlier session. I personally think that electrolyte development is a huge issue. I think high-voltage electrolytes, whether it be ionic liquids or solid-state electrolytes, could be transformative. I definitely think that's an issue. And we're not, you know, we really try not to pick technologies to be winners. So it could be a lithium-ion. It could be a zinc-air battery. It really doesn't matter. So I hate to be prescriptive in the chemistry. But generally speaking, electrolytes, I think, would be better electrolytes to be transformative in the field of batteries in particular. Okay. Just a quick follow-up on the rate, charging rate. What charging rates are you thinking about? So I think one of the interesting ways to think about charging rates 
is the way, uh, as I know someone at Tesla said, the way they think about it is in terms of miles per hour. How many miles you can drive for every hour of charging. And you want to be able to go a couple hundred miles an hour. Right? So if you're standing at a gas pump, you have, you're filling up your car, you look at the number of megawatts flowing through that pump. That's what you're trying to defeat. That's what, the, or emulate, right? That's the current status of the technology. So why can't you do that? What's the physical, what's the chemical, what's the challenge for this to make it safe, reliable, abundant, handle high throughput charging, high energy density? Those so are it, all challenges. To, to answer more specifically, 20C. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, and to build on that, if you're looking in terms of energy storage, I think we'd want, you know, at a minimum, maybe 20 to 30 uh, miles per minute of charge. Yeah. I mean, I think the EER Eagle is somewhere, you know, a little bit lower. But I mean, it's, uh, it, it, you know, by also doing the miles per minute of charge, it kind of takes away from people that would just say, well, I have this capacitor that charges in two minutes. Well, that's great. Well, how many miles can you get from that after you charge it up? Thank you. So I want to thank you all for joining us here. Time's expired at this point. I think we're moving off to our next session is, uh, where's the next session? Lunch. Lunch. Hey. Lunch. Thank you all. <laughs> Appreciate it.